Hi, everyone. Welcome to the timingresearch.com crowd forecast news for February 28th, 2022. We are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and this is episode number 333. My name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of timingresearch.com. And uh, today I have arranged for Leslie Jufloss and Eric Gebhardt to join us as our guests today. And uh, the option professor is back to moderate. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Sure. Thanks, David. And boy, do we have a lot of action on Monday morning here again. After last week, of course, uh, very volatile week. And this week we're hitting it again. So we've got a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about a lot of different areas and hopefully get some insight onto what uh, might be happening here. Although in this environment, who knows? Um, with us uh, is Eric. Um, Eric, could you just give it a little background on yourself and also the company? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for having me sure. back, uh, David and Jim. Yep. Well, I've been doing this for, believe it or not, just over 30 years now. And when I say this, I've been in the futures markets and more specifically, we do futures options. Um, in the last uh, decade, I'd say has been a focus using technology and algorithms to trade option spreads. And we have a proprietary software package that we offer and helps people navigate the uh, S&P 500 market when trading option spreads, we have a unique approach to uh, collecting premium. We have sort of a kind of an odd spread strategy using uh, six legs. It's kind of a complicated thing, but we simplify it with our software. So that's what we do is service that type of uh, customer base and offering something a bit different, a little more unique than traditional uh, being long and or short. We can be uh, directional and non-directional in nature. Okay, and we'll get into more of the details on how that works and how the options right, right now in this environment might be uh, affecting your strategies a bit one way or the other. Uh, Leslie, a uh, little uh, background on yourself and also um, on Trading Live Online. Sure, yeah, Trading Live Online, that, that's my website. It's an educational website. I, I use a specific pattern recognition and that's what I teach and that's what I trade. And I've been in the markets over 25 years. Um, I'm a chartered market technician as well. And um, yeah, I love the chart patterns. And I think these markets that we have right now are pretty exciting. I, I really like these uh, these swings. Can't, yeah, you can't get, every, if, every if you like, single if you like one volatility, of them. Yeah. You're, you, if you like yeah. volatility, you're a kid in a candy store. Huh? Don't always get it the first time, but <laughs> yeah. keep trying. And I did, I did want to say to uh, listeners out there that uh, Eric's company is called altavest.com. So uh, Eric Gebhard, uh, um, the people who want to get a hold of him, it's uh, altavest.com. Um, okay, so let's get started with our standard fare. Our standard fare on Monday is the S&P open today um, at a certain level, which I will get to in a second. And we're going to ask you guys with your crystal ball and all the rest of the uh, things you use, uh, where you think we're going to close on Friday. So um, the reference point I'm using is S&P cash, which is SPX, and I'm using a reference point of 30, excuse me, 4354. So we opened at 4354 on the cash on Friday. Uh, Leslie, where do you think we're going to be up, down, I, sideways? And what's your confidence yeah. level? Yeah, you know, I think, honestly, I think this is a hard week to predict because it's so um, news driven in yeah, a way yeah. this week. Yeah. So I think for me, I'm just really watching levels. Um, I, you know, I really, sorry, I, I just can't give you a good guess on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I just have levels that if it exceeds this level, I believe it's going to be higher. If it exceeds this level, you know, lower, and I'm sure we'll get into to those. Yeah, in a yeah we'll bit. talk about the technicals. And anybody who would not understand why it's difficult to predict what the prices are going to be during a war and during a lockdown of an entire nation's financial system, I mm -hmm. think uh, obviously need some hot coffee. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I need so, some hot Anyway, I don't know why they need the hot coffee. That's their problem. Right? Um, anyway, we're going to Eric. Eric, uh, you got a stab here at uh, 43.54 up, down, or sideways? Eric? Yes, I'm back. Oh, oh good, good. Okay, you didn't so, miss me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I am looking at, dare I say, 4,200. Okay, so you're thinking uh, going to the south. 
you know, I, I, I'm a little leaning uh, that way because that 4,400 number to me on the SPX is extremely important. There's a one year moving average on my long term graphs, uh, SMA 12 month. And uh, when that broke, that's when all heck broke loose on the downside. And if you notice, when we came back up, it didn't exceed that level. So I have a pretty good size line in the sand at around 4,400 mm -hmm. S&P. And I would change my tune significantly if we started closing above that number. Mm -hmm. You guys think that number might be of any significance or mm -hmm. what do you think? I, I do. Yeah, I definitely, both of those, both of those levels on the, um, the SPX uh, using a weekly chart, there's a, a trend line break that 4,200. It's, it'll actually break that trend line a little bit above 4,200, a little bit below 4,300 of what I have drawn, drawn in. And yeah, definitely the, the 4,400 on the upside. I think that there's a potential head and shoulders pattern uh, on the SPX. Um, if it breaks that lower portion, that's going to validate it. Sure. As long as it doesn't exceed, you see those last two highs. And yeah, uh, yeah that, that could be a potential right shoulder. Yeah. The, what do you call it? Uh, the, also the direction of the one year um, has turned down, which is never a, you know, tremendously positive thing, you know? So uh, that's one thing we were all seeing. And so I think we hit on that one. But um, let's uh, talk about things that are coming up uh, uh, soon or this week, uh, Eric, that you're looking at fundamentally or technically that might be uh, market moving. Well, you know, certainly you have, you know, Chairman, Fed Chairman Powell uh, talking tomorrow and I believe Wednesday, kind of mm -hmm. his scheduled um, remarks to, to Congress on policy. And I think, you know, there's, um, I was just reading that at the March FOMC meeting, I, be I believe there's now, uh, was it 31 basis points factored in in terms of a hike? I think that was the exact number I was reading mm -hmm. uh, earlier this morning, if, if I recall. But uh, you know, you have Goldman Sachs coming out talking about uh, within the next, uh, till 2023, I think something like 10 to 12 rate hikes is what they're mm. projecting. Yeah. If I, if I'm uh, not mistaken, yeah. but you know, that's kind of, I, I suspect, you know, markets are forward looking and they do their best to discount things, but uh, you know, that being the case, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a tightening environment. And at the same time you have, you know, GDP uh, slowing. And of course now you have these geopolitical affairs. So I, you know, I, I'm just thinking that, you uh, it's probably a good idea to, I, I recall Leslie earlier, just a few minutes ago saying kind of sometimes the best trade is patience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, yeah. or, or not really even having a large position, but I think it does make sense, you know, from our, our perspective to have some sort of hedge in place if you have a portfolio right. and something to that effect. But in terms of what to look forward to this week, I think obviously Whenever the the Fed speaks, and the chairman especially, uh, the market listens like that old advertisement. Was that Dean Witter? Anyone remember that? Remember that? I think it's Dean Witter. I, when... Oh, I was that Dean. I, I do. Just, remember I just remember John Houseman. They earned the money. You know that. Yeah. Was it? I don't know. They the people are talking and everyone's talking, and then the guy comes into the room or the gal comes into the room and starts talking about. The markets and everyone's quiet listening to what they have to say so oh ef hutton ef, EF hutton. hutton yes thank you thank you anyway. well i was gonna say um so obviously uh, you're focused on and everyone should be focused on and what the fed's going to do um do you think the ism reports on tuesday and thursday on manufacturing and services and the jobs report is going to be back burner because of all the geopolitical yeah i certainly wouldn't wouldn't want to trade on that yeah, I wouldn't want to trade on any type of it's historic. print. Yeah. yeah, it's historic. Yeah. Uh, with regards to one other thing that's an advantage of some of the approaches you use um, is that, you know, when you set a parameter uh, through strike prices, you have a discipline. And then while the market runs around to all these different prices, um, since you have your strike prices set and your discipline, you know, you don't really react to every uh, nook and cranny, right? Yeah, I just you know, 20 seconds worth here, there's a large margin of error yeah. with what we're doing in yeah. the non-directional strategy. So, yeah. you know, right now we have a April end of month trade on the uh, E-mini S&P 500 mm -hmm. and the lower boundary is 3680 and the upper boundary is 4840. So 
we've got that's pretty, a that's, you know that's pretty that's pretty darn good and you know we've had a range of 4100 to 4400 it's not inconceivable that that is the range during this entire crisis right so you know even though there may be a lot of volatility along the way yeah. that type of strategy uh at least according to the uh, statistics and the math suggests uh you know a high probability of success but at the same time, we also offer non-directional approaches, and we've been doing some of that as well, looking yeah. to catch some of these uh, these swings up and down. And the VIX has also been volatile. It's been as high as 38, as low as 27. Now it's at around 31. But to, uh, some people that are not options uh, specialists, uh, they don't understand that options, uh, when the premiums get this big, spreads and even um, individual out-of-the-money options, they don't go one for one with the market. Correct, and that's a big advantage when the VIX does get elevated, you can capture a lot of premium that way, mm -hmm. uh, even being further away from the current market. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's another, just real quickly, you know, the VIX is sort of showing a higher, uh, series of higher and higher lows here mm -hmm. uh, in the last, I guess, three months or so in particular. So, you know, that, that trend at the moment seems to be intact. In so that would kind of suggest further downside on the S&P and, yeah. I know the VIX, of course, will always mean revert at some point, but right, uh, right now, you know, the trend does seem to be uh, higher, more higher than lower. Yeah, the big uh, word this week with the Fed is going to be liquidity, because obviously in this kind of an environment, uh, the system can get a little bit uh, goofy. And, um, you know, if, if they don't come across with the proper liquidity and you see the VIX going 35 or 40, you know, we're going to have uh, we're going to have more of a, a problem than. Uh, then if they come out and it seems like everything's under control and you take out 27 on the VIX, I think if you took out 27 on the VIX, that might be pretty popular. I mean, pretty uh, positive, you know? So sometimes you can look at the VIX and get some kind of an idea, you know, like we, we couldn't get underneath 20 in the month of February. So that was kind of indicating a little negative situation. Then we got above 25, that kind of confirmed a little negative, then above 30. So, you know, the VIX uh, is not a bad indicator to get an idea of, you know, um, potential weakness or strength, you know? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Leslie, uh, with regards to yourself, um, we got these uh, reports that I was just mentioning and uh, Fed testimony and anything else uh, that you're focused on this week that might be a game changer? Well, interesting, um, Eric, the, the numbers that he just mentioned, that downside 3680, if that is a head and shoulder pattern and it does break that trend line, and of course, that's what validates that pattern, um, then the, the target roughly is about 3720 on the downside mm -hmm. that's on the futures. And so that's kind of uh, right in line with that. And I think last time we talked about some retracement levels to the downside. Mm -hmm. As far as the Fed speak, um, yeah, I uh, it looks to me from the price action that we're seeing there, the market is doing its best right now to fool as many people as possible. Um, we're getting a lot of kind of range type um, action. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty evident even on a short term uh, basis this morning, it, you know, down, large gap down, back up, back down. And so I think for, you know, those of us that are based in technical analysis right. is going to create um, a pretty clear picture of whatever the Fed speak is, whatever happens um, uh, internationally, it, those price levels are going to tell us which direction to go. Now, what probability would you give on the uh, idea that this uh, chart we see on the screen here is a clear uh, divergence in RSI, and there's a clear trend line at 4,500. Do you give yeah. any weight that we might have a very strong surprise up to 4,500 as that uh, divergence will be significant? Or do you think it's more likely that we'll just go back down and this uh, RSI will turn back down? Well, on the chart that you've got up right now, the RSI is just slightly turned down, but the important areas on that RSI to watch are those previous peaks, those last three peaks on it. Okay. If, if the price exceeds those areas, the 4,400 level, 4,500 yeah. level that we've been talking about, and RSI exceeds those peaks with it, I believe it'll be a stronger move to the upside. Right. However, if we get more upside and the RSI is struggling to turn um, higher 
higher, yeah. then I think that's a good indication of downside. On some of my charts, some of my intraday charts that I'm watching with the RSI, even on a couple of my daily charts, um, I'm seeing the RSI just test the very lower end of a bullish range. So if the price declines and that bullish range is broken, to me, that's definitely going to be an indication it's, it's lower. So Also, if you notice on RSI, when it does break under 40 is when you, sometimes you can accelerate to the downside. That's you got exactly two, you got, right. You got two examples right in front of your face there. That's exactly right. That's why I'm saying, yeah, that lower, um, the 40-ish area, uh, for the S and P is about the the lower, and actually you can go dip a little bit below that, but right now it's right about at forty, um, and that's um, the lower end of that bullish range, and it's just it's testing it with yeah. this price movement, and it's interesting, it's not really mm. coming up strongly, you know, with this yeah. last up move that yeah. we've had. So I I am a little suspicious of this up move, but yeah. you know I I don't know exactly where price is going to go. I'm just going to watch these price levels and patterns. Now, Eric, you're talking about the Fed, and um, I was listening to Kathy Jones over at um, uh, Schwab uh, on Bloomberg interview today, and she was outlining an idea that if the Fed is going to be timid in the hikes because of the geopolitical, uh, that the 10-year note could go down towards 150. If the 10-year note is going down towards 150, and Powell talks more like a printer than a uh, than a remover of liquidity. <laughs> Do you uh, think that that might bode very well for um, the ARC funds and the tech stocks and the semis that have been kind of nailed and the small caps like the Russell? Um, uh, well, because, because that burden of higher interest rates will be off their back a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great uh, question. You kind of set me up for an easy answer. I think, you know, without being an expert in individual stocks, you know, having having said that, I think that's clear that uh, you know if you had something like that occur, then you know technology will have a bit of a um, a, a breather. The uh, the boot may be removed from the neck, so to speak, to some degree. Right. Right. And you know, I, I do agree though. Like with Leslie commenting on just some of the technicals, I do like looking at RSI. Right? We're not totally technical driven, and we use some algos and other quantitative things as well, and even looking at uh, global macro, but I do think the RSI can be very useful, uh, not necessarily in what it is confirming, but what it is not confirming, mm. uh, looking at divergences and so forth as well. But um, yeah, and I think in terms of yields, uh, I think the the range in terms of yields uh, is going to be moving lower. I think that makes sense with what's happening in a lot of ways, economically, but also geopolitically. So. Uh, you know, that would be a good, you know, good opportunity or a good excuse, having said that, to, um, to consider that maybe tech may get a breather. But let me also point out that shares of Apple have, uh, you know, I'm no expert on Apple, but shares of Apple have been struggling. Um, and, you know, I think Apple is something to look at kind of as Apple goes, maybe, or at least it's one of the four or five that uh, drive really the, the bulk of the market, the you know, in terms of what, what is it? Uh, the changes was Fang and now it's Faming or whatever and Meta. And I don't know, they changed uh -huh. their names, but uh -huh. um, so what is it? Something like 25% of the market cap, I think in the S&P is just those five companies. So if, uh, if Apple continue, continues to struggle, then I don't know how that, um, how that allows the broader market itself to, yeah, because it's uh, a diverge. heavily weighted stock in all the indexes is what your point is, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Leslie, uh, what are the uh, wicks telling you here? You're a technical person. What are the wicks <laughs> telling you? Well, let's look at the wicks. <laughs> Actually, um, it's interesting because from last week um, when the S&P um, futures found support, uh, it created a hammer um, candle. So the lows of that candle are going to be uh, be very important uh, because generally when a pattern like that, that is very bullish um, is exceeded on the downside, the lows of that, then it um, turns it into the opposite signal. So it's no longer a buy signal, it becomes a sell signal. So that's going to be, um, and actually I think the weekly chart, I think if, 
if you could, if you have can a we weekly a, can chart we, of the can SPX, get a weekly up there, Dan? yeah, SPX weekly would do it. The W, yeah. So you can see the hammer there. Um, and today the price has just been sort of um, almost contained within the real body of um, of that hammer. And and the hammer is the very large wick that's coming down? Yes, that's okay. right. It's the very large wick and then you have a smaller real body kind of sitting on, on top of it. Gotcha. Okay. And is that considered like a heavy formation? Uh, that's a that's a bullish formation. However, okay. it's validated when there's a close above it, which we have not that. seen yet. And so, even though there was a strong move to the upside, we we haven't seen the confirmation of that particular candle signal yet. Right. So the lows of that candle are very important uh, to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, and that low is forty one fourteen. Uh, yeah. on the SPX. So yeah. that's an area you want to watch. However, there's a trend line that's coming up, as I mentioned, um, before that, before that number. And it's mm -hmm. going to be just below 4,300 on the SPX. It's, if it gets below there and closes, it's going to be a break of that trend line. And in my view, it's also going to be a confirmation of a head and shoulder pattern. Yeah, because a couple of uh, boxes over there, you had a pretty long wick. And then uh, within a couple of um, um, bars, you were right back in the soup. Yeah, and that one, that particular one, that's actually not quite a hammer. It's similar to one, but I, I don't think that if we, we broke it down uh, to its components, it quite meets it. However, because of the long wick of it, that's telling us the bulls were able to push that price up um, from the lows, but it didn't get a lot of sustainability. It had one day above it and then right back down again. And then it created another, um, that one is a hammer um, that I was just talking about a minute ago. So that one's gonna be super important to watch. Yeah. And it's um, right the low of the one previous to that, um, Jim, is right at that 4,200 level that you were talking about a little while ago. Why don't we take a look at the QQQs and IWM and get the idea of what um, tech and small caps look like? Because they're a different animal. Definitely. And are you seeing anything different in the Qs than uh, you're yeah. seeing? Yeah. Just a sec, I'm I'm still scrolling. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Sec, where's my cues? Because they are down more than the S and P, and so like if they take mm -hmm. the um, uh, interest rate monkey off their back, they it may is. have more potential. Or uh, if this guy goes to uh, listen, we're going, you know, ahead because you know they're trying to get the balance sheet down, and now there's people on TV talking about how they're going to provide liquidity, which is going to make the balance sheet go up. So, I mean, talk about, uh, you know, both sides of the fence, you know? Yeah, the on the um, on the triple Qs, so I see um, you know, there it had formed the triple Qs were not following the NASDAQ when the NASDAQ was reaching up to new highs and uh, late December and January. Right. And the Qs had formed a sideways range on the daily chart. You can kind of see it there. If you spread that chart out just a little bit more, you'd be able to see where that that oh, sideways yeah. range was and then where that um big red candle as you can see where it broke to the downside so the cues were um, weaker than the nasdaq showing weakness um, sooner and they they've they recovered a little bit on this last bounce but they're still looking pretty pretty weak and the rsi right now is looks like it's poised to turn down again i got you and uh, the iwm which is your russell the Russell um, has been really interesting. Um, the, similar, very similar. The Russell had what's called a butterfly cell pattern, just uh, completed right about where the highs were um, up there. And uh, it just has not been um, acting well. It, it uh, of course, is you know the bellwether um, for the small cap stocks. Mm -hmm. And it, it has been showing weakness for quite some time, you know, ahead of the NASDAQ. Right. And uh, it had a false move to the upside uh, and then back down, broke to the downside. So. 
Let's uh, look at one last thing before we move on, and that's the uh, transportation stocks, because, you know, um, mm -hmm. Buffett came out with his uh, report over the weekend, and one of his huge holdings is um, um, the railroad. Uh, the only competitive real big company competes with them is Union Pacific, UNP. But let's take a look at IYT and get an idea, because at some point, all this uh, bottleneck has got to be delivered. And so some people think there's uh, something happening here, but... Uh, it looks like it's just got a little less uh, bad look to it, huh? A little, yeah. Hang on just a second, Jim. Give me just yeah. a sec here. Because again, the transportation oh, index, um, uh, you know, I mean, I was looking at the stock of uh, Union Pacific and uh, it's had a tremendous run over the last years. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And well, like uh, Buffett yeah. says, you know, this stuff has to get someplace. It's not going to go on Camelback. It's going by uh, rail, you know. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just, it's in a big range. It's yeah. just in a big, it's in a big range and it's just mm -hmm. about in the middle of its range right now. Yeah. So it's sort of the jury is out on it. There's not yeah. much that looks like where the yellow and the blue are rising together anymore, huh? Uh, no, it's just sideways. Which might be telling us the winds of change are actually blowing, right? It'll, yeah, and it'll, you know, these are actually really nice types of patterns, the sideways mm -hmm. ranges, because yeah. you don't really have to do much until the price tells you which way it's going. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, you know, obviously the daily and the weekly graphs have been violated. Uh, so now the only thing left is the long term graphs, your 10 and 20 year graphs. And that's where your 36, 3800 S&P comes in, which would be the full reversion down towards the long term mean. And that's, I think, what you're alluding to the potential of those uh, lower numbers you're talking about. Is that? Yeah, Leslie. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. that's right. They're starting to get into some retracements. And again, that um, is the potential head and shoulder target, mm -hmm. uh, you know, close to that area, you know, on any, you know, 40 point difference on the S&P anymore is not much, you know, it can be at one bar on a five minute right. chart these days. Right. Right. So it's pretty close to what Eric's, uh, Eric has also. Hey, Eric, what has it, how has it affected the VIX being at this elevated level? How has it affected the uh, spread market as far as when you're looking at spreads? Has it cut down your time uh, risk significantly or have you kept the same time risk? But, are, you know, in other words, like say typically you went out right. just for an example, a month uh, or two months or whatever, and you would generally go how many standard deviations away from current value uh, because the premiums are so big. Have you just stuck with those standard deviation number kind of things, or have you kind of tightened the time in? No, very good question. The, the model that we're using will automatically do that for us. So we kind of reel in the time as the VIX and the value becomes elevated. Mm -hmm. So in the past, you may have to go out 70 to 80 days of time on these spreads that we're selling. Mm -hmm. And now we're looking more like the maximum might be 60 days. So, so that that's, a, that's excellent. You know, whenever you can cut the duration down, you got to love that because, you know, on the buy side, you, on options, you're fighting time and price. On the sell side, you know, you've got those two elements working for you. And so um, the less, right. the less um, risk on 50% of it, which is your time risk, uh, the better. And then if you can also combine that with a uh, strike price that uh, is fairly far away from current value, you know, that's not a bad environment. Right. I mean, this, this environment, you know, we can certainly adapt to it. And that's kind of, uh, we've been doing this long enough to yeah. know how that, you know, to play that game, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to really apply the same static approach and strategy to every environment. You know, you have to move with the dynamics of the market. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what we attempt to do. So you know, at the same time, we can sell premium and perhaps uh, recover that that trade, you know, by within half the time. So we don't necessarily, in fact, we never uh, will place a trade and then stay in it to uh, expiration. So we're going to get out of that trade before it expires, regardless yeah. if it's a win or a loss. Yeah, I think you believe, I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but, you know, my, my feeling is, you know, if you sell an option for uh, $2 and it gets underneath a half, you are no longer getting paid for that risk. So obviously, you know, would you take a, a risk of, you know, 50 cents going to $2, you know, or going to the full um, uh, width of the spread? 
And, you know, then you got to start using your common sense on, you know, are you getting paid any more to take the risk? Because anything can happen in the markets, right? Well, I tell you what, it's it's common sense if you've been doing it maybe as long as you have and right. all the experience we have. But right. I can tell you how many, I, I can't count the times in which yeah. we have clients that will say, okay, I've, I've sold this spread for, let's just use a number. I've sold this spread for three points on the mini S&P 500. And there's, um, it's going well. And now the spread is worth um, 50 cents. And our algorithm says that's when you get out and cover the trade and take your win and move on. And the mm -hmm. trade might have three or four weeks of time re remaining. Right. Uh, meanwhile, their thought is, well, why would I cover that trade? Why would I pay anything to get out of it? It's going so well. Mm -hmm. And the market's not really doing anything. It's kind of quiet. And, you know, I'm 500 points, points away from the nearest, you know, from my put or my, my call or whatever it might be. And so they, right. they kind of rationalize their way into thinking that nothing can happen. Right. Uh, but, you know, you do that enough times and something will happen. And so yeah. you're taking a, a winning trade and then having to cover it for a large lump on the head. And there's really hardly anything left to be gained. So you have the same risk and you're refusing to cover it for a very small price. And right. meanwhile, your money's not working for you in a new trade. So right. you're losing on opportunity cost and, um, you know, you're also probably mentally distracted as well. When you have a trade like that, it starts to move against you. Um, and it really kind of eats at you and, uh, you know, it's I, not, I, it's not good for you financially or psychologically. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a mess all the way around. So. Yeah. And the other thing is, is uh, you're then, once you get underneath 50 cents, you know, you are now running with the crowd that is picking up uh, pennies in front of a, um, Steamroller. a, a locomotion, a <laughs> locomotive, you know, and that crowd is finding out in the last week or so that um, what we were talking about here can happen, which means you're selling very small premium that you think has a 90% chance of going to zero. Cause that's the, that's the big wrap on that. You know, it's got a 90% probability. Well, that, you know, 10% when it, where it doesn't work out, not only blows out your profits, it blows out your principal. You know? Well, the problem with using that, uh, and we use that similar type of uh, logic, but on a much longer dated position where you're right. much further away from the market, but you start doing that on weekly positions. Um, and that starts to uh, kind of lose its usefulness. Um, mm. So yeah, absolutely. I think, and also here's a, here's a big mistake and I'll make a comment and uh, we can go on, but I think people have a misconception too when they're looking at options and the probability of an option expiring out of the money. Uh, you know, they think, okay, well, if there's a 90% probability that this put I'm selling is going to expire out of the money, they equate that to a 90% probability of a winning trade. <laughs> right. And that's two completely different things. Yeah. That's so a flawed thinking. It's very flawed. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Leslie, do you watch the commodities at all? Because um, I'll tell you, um, I'm looking at the price of wheat uh, was at 960, then it dropped down to 860. Now it's back at 920. Soybeans went up to 1770, went down to 1580. Now it's at 1660. So um, those yeah, people that are uh, trying to trade, uh, you know, uh, the commodities certainly uh, are getting volatility, but they better, you know, be on the right it's, side of it. Huh? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's it's probably yeah. It's a I, I see some nice patterns uh, in here. I see where there some nice. I haven't been following them really closely um, right. lately, but um, I see there were some really nice patterns. There were some interesting, you know, some buy patterns. It's always interesting. The types of patterns that I use, they tend to show up well ahead of any news that comes out that um, the direction that that pattern is leading to, such as a buy pattern, a uh, strong buy pattern in wheat back in the beginning of July, uh, this type pattern that I use, you know, that's well ahead of, you know, what the, what is in the news now that can be driving, you know, that up move. Um, and so now we've had sort of a big, you had a big blow off and now it's sort of back up. I don't know. There's nothing, I don't, it doesn't look really tradable right where it is right now. Right. Um, it has to sort of settle, settle in. Uh, with it, but yeah, the commodity markets, the corn, the wheat, uh, you know, the grains have been have been really moving. Now there are two areas, um, and I wouldn't mind throwing a few stocks up there for you to take a look at. But uh, there are a few areas, a couple of areas, uh, where um, 
people are actually making money owning them uh, as opposed to losing money. And that is in the energy and the metals, mm -hmm. both precious and industrial. Mm -hmm. um, this Cleveland Cliff CLF, I've been very keen on anything above uh, anything around 18, 19. Now I'm getting a pop. Is there, is there longer term potential here? Um, well, what do you think? Take a look. Yeah. Hang on just a sec. Well, it held those lows really nicely uh, mm -hmm. back in January at that 15 uh, level, bit of a you know, what I call an ABCD buy pattern. Um, right now, it's had these three strong bars, you know, to the upside. Right. It just it really needs to clear that 24 and a half, and then yeah. the 26 and a half area. But that that lower, you know, um, you know, three bars back, 17 and a half, you know that should there's the four letter word in trading mm -hmm. should <laughs> uh, you know hold a support if it's going to go higher if it if it tests back a little bit from here i from those lows um three bars back i i wouldn't expect it if it's going to hold uh, with more strength to the upside to retrace more than about 50 percent of the last three days yeah, so it's, you know, we should be done does. with 18. We should be done with 18 if this thing's any good, right? Oh, oh definitely. Yeah. 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 In my uh, another one in the same uh, honor is VALE, which is a Brazilian company, also oh. in industrial metals. Okay, yeah. hang on just a sec. That sounds interesting. I try yeah, to look for things that are metals. going. If you're going to buy something, I try to find things that are going up, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good. That's a great. You put that in a bumper sticker. Or yeah. <laughs> Want to win? Yeah. Buy things that are going up. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at it. It had a classic, you know, um, a kind of cup and handle type of pattern mm -hmm. on the bottom uh, there. Um, you know, it's above its moving averages, uh, showing strength in the the, the candle. Uh, moves up. Um, it might find a little bit of resistance, another couple points up, but then just watch the the test back. A pullback might be a, you know, a good opportunity on this. Uh, everyone seems to be into, involved with like Exxon and Chevron, but I've been into this Suncor SU, and it does look like it's a, it's a Canadian firm uh, on energy. And uh, yeah, maybe we would buy more stuff from them. I don't know. Can we look at SU? It, yeah, of course. Because it's way underneath where it was years oh. ago, you know. Oh well, it's just breaking. It looks like it's just breaking, you know, out to the upside from mm -hmm. um, a consolidation range. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put on my. Do you have a daily up or is that a? I'm gonna put a weekly up on my chart and see what we have. Well, it's gonna. It looks like it'll probably get maybe testing some resistance around 32 and a half up to 34 and a half. But if it clears mm -hmm. that, then it, it looks like it'll probably challenge the old highs from 2018. Now, a couple of stocks that are into the exploration area uh, is um, you know Schlumberger SLB, mm -hmm. and um, it's been yeah, kinda... that's had a good run, but yeah. it's just con looks like it's consolidating here. It's a little um, draggy compared to like Halliburton HAL. Yeah, Another HAL has been has been uh, has been stronger. Yeah, and then D uh, D uh, Devon DVN is it Devon Energy? Yeah, there was one I had DVN. I yeah, featured. Oh yeah. Um, on just a sec. Let me add that one too to my to my list so I can. Take a look yeah, here. The, those are three. Those are three uh, ones that seem to be doing pretty good. I like that Canada one though. For some reason, I got a feeling, mm -hmm. you know, that um, uh, that's going to become more important um, simply because it's you know you can get your stuff from a you know a more uh, stable source or something. You know. Yeah. Well, gee, DVN. I mean, this has been in a strong uptrend, yeah. you know, since two thousand. 2020 when yeah. down there around seven was a buy pattern yep. um it's been making buy patterns on the way up it's just breaking out to highs again um yeah just it looks it looks like it still has um potentially more strength to it but you can see the energy does seem to and obviously for obvious reasons and has been ever since we had that minus 37 dollars a barrel back in 2020 you know what i mean it's been right you know, it's been going yeah. up because you know they they structurally made the energy tighter. Uh, the big the big question is is uh, on the goal. You know, I mean, my history of experience is you know if you have seven percent inflation, 
and you've got a 1% handle on interest rates, I mean, gold should be flying because, you know, it's just showing, but the dollar's strong. So that's the offsetting penalty here. But let's take a look, you know, let's take a look at gold and silver and see if there's something going on there for the future here. Um, there you go with the gold. What do you think of the actual price of gold? Well, I've, do you have, yeah, you've got, well, I've been using GLD um, and there was a very, very large uh, triangle pattern that had been forming for quite a while, I've been following it mm -hmm. on my, you know, weekly subscriber list and on some other um, segments that, that I do. And it, it broke out uh, oh, close to, close to two weeks ago, right about that 172 uh, level. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does need to get above that 194 in order, you know, to really get going to the upside. It's mm -hmm. had, you know, nice, you know, smaller move to the upside here. It's getting a little bit of stalling, but I believe if it comes back down into around 170, it's, it's done. It's just not going to be going anywhere. So With regards to that long red um, bar, is that uh, concerning to you? I mean, historically, if you see something like that, is that a spike up top that's going to last for a while? You know, I'm not seeing that on my on my chart. Let me. Well, you, you see, a, there's a big spike I up to above on 182. Yours, yeah. Yeah. Are you? Is that on your daily chart, Jim? Oh, uh, this is uh, David's. Uh, yeah, that's uh, daily. Um, and then this is weekly. Oh, there it is. Okay. Well, it just depends. It depends on the test down. You've got a gap up from 174, about 174.86. Mm -hmm. So that's the the gap up. Um, the trend line that's coming down uh, would be down around 172 and a half. But you'd mm -hmm. want to see if this is a strong move. You'd want to see any test into that gap hold. I wouldn't right. want to see it just plummet right right through it. Um, you know, there's a lot of volatility in a lot of things. And I think there's um, a lot of mentality of um, uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. Yeah. And I think that that might be a little bit in here, but unless some of these levels are taken out, it's, it's still, it's still holding. Yeah. yeah. It's now, still holding. Uh, when we have a wick that looks like that, and then the next bar is still red, but it's above the box prior. The real, the real body. Yeah. yeah. Any, any, um, any reading on that historically or? Yeah. Well, generally, um, again, you, you, to validate that candle, that's almost a shooting star type of candle pattern to validate that it would need a close below um, the, well, close below the close of that shooting star, but mm -hmm. you're, you still, you can see the moving averages are rising on this chart. Oh, yeah. And the thing with candles is they don't give you any type of price projection. They give you zero type of price projection. So you can have a scenario where you have a bearish looking um, candle like that, and you get the validation of the close below, but then it only comes down and does a bit of a retracement. Well, yeah. the candle sort of still did what it said it was going to do. But you didn't get much action out of right, it. Right, exactly. I so, you. But here's how I like to use them. I, I like to use them in a reverse way. So if you, you get a move below that real body, and then it turns back up and it takes out on the upside the um, high price of that wick, that's a reversal signal to the upside. I guess what, in, in, in conclusion people. here, just to, before we get into a few stocks, the idea on gold here is it does look like it's in a positive mode because you are at a reasonable RSI. The moving averages are pointing up, but because of that spike and things like that, we could either consolidate or pull back a little bit. But the, the trends of it all and the strength of the relativeness of it is still pretty firm. Unless it takes out, yeah, those levels that we that we that you just about. mentioned, yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know, one that I had uh, um, just last week, I was watching the symbol RGLD, um, and that also, you know, breaking out of a, a sideways pattern, it broke out about one oh one oh eight, um, and that one also is still looking, you know, like it's got strength to it, unless it comes back down into that previous. Um, you know, into that previous range. So again, I think what we're seeing is just some, you know, potential um, um, buy the rumor, sell some news. And right. so now we're going to see if these prices have some some legs 
you some know, legitimacy to them. Yeah. So they've, if they start making highs above these recent um, red candles that you're seeing, then the, it's telling you it's got some strength to it. With regards to the RSI, you know, another observations I have had is, is that if you are above 60 on the RSI, and for whatever reason you start trading under 57 or 55, that sometimes can lead to a, a good size drop as well. Uh, and we're trading right around 60. So if this RSI started going down towards 55, that could be an indicator that a more reasonable drop could be going on? I, in my view of this, looking at the RSI in my chart, not necessarily. And that's because the, the, the pattern that the RSI has made mm -hmm. um, has been in a sideways range. And with this breakout to the upside, the RSI moved higher. Mm -hmm. So when the prices pull back, they tend to pull back into those areas. Like if it gets to 55, it's pulling back into a bullish area on the right. RSI. And so, no, I wouldn't necessarily come to a conclusion that that would mean it's going to be a bigger drop. It would be more true if uh, like it was back in November and December, it's already got a propensity of declining. Right. Back in, um, actually, yeah. If we look at the RSI and you go all the way back to, let's say like July, well, actually go all the way back to May of 2021 on the mm -hmm. RSI. If, yep. You can see where that peak is on yeah. May and you see how the RSI dropped down to um, a kind of a low peak. It created sort of a lower sideways range mm -hmm. on that. And so it was creating the bearish zone for that particular um, segment of time. Mm -hmm. And now that range has changed from the bearish to the bullish range right. on the RSI. So yeah. I don't use, I don't, I rarely use RSI um, in a traditional manner. I use it in, in ranges um, and um, I look for the ranges and then I watch for that shift from bullish to bearish. And so when there is that shift, um, it throws the traditional um, thinking about RSI a little bit out the window, like, oh, if it comes back down to 55, that means it's, you know, going to become more bearish. Not necessarily. If it's created a new bullish zone, then that might just be testing that level. And that's a new bullish zone on the RSI. And that is conversely true with bearish ranges. Okay. Let's take a look at a couple of stocks. One we're, uh, On the gold, we'll look at one big one, one small one, and then silver the same. So on the gold, let's look at GOLD, which is Barrick Gold. And uh, them and uh, Newmont, to me, always seem to be the lead horses in the race as far as good-sized companies. And um, I was noticing that it looks like on a longer-term basis, it, it may, be, uh, may be doing something. Yeah, it's well, it's pulling back <laughs> yeah, yeah. right now. Um, it looks like it may be forming. It's had a kind of a volume spike up there at the highs, um, but it did come out again, like so many of them came out of uh, came out of a range, a little bit right. longer range. Um, this one looks like it might be forming an ABCD buy pattern. Okay, um, and so let me draw that in. I'll tell you where I see those levels. And those would actually be testing back down to, to where some of these um, bars really got going to the upside. So the first level, if it's if this is an ABCD pattern, um, and if it gets below that 22 uh, without exceeding the 2359, uh, generally speaking, then look around that 2130-ish area to about 2090. So we get under there, the likelihood of a, of a more... Um sizable pullback increases no that could be a buy area okay yeah that after could be it a drops buy though zone. right yes yeah, yeah. yeah so it may just be doing a bit of a correction here and some right. testing similar uh, to the goal similar yeah similar yeah. and again the rsi created a nice bullish uh, you know change from bearish to bullish um with that basing pattern that it had and then it it came back up above the previous peaks up to about 75, which is about normal. And now if you saw this drop back down to like, you know, 50 ish, 55 ish, mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't be negative in my opinion. Now, what about um, AUY, which is a smaller one called it Yamana Gold, uh, AUY. And uh, okay. you know, if that thing gets going, it could oh. be a good thing. Yeah, yeah hang on. 
No, you've got such good symbols today, Jim. Yeah. I stayed up all night. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's similar. It's it's a similar type of um, yeah. similar type of a pattern. And it, you know, it got up and it was testing those previous highs uh, from April, May, or actually May and June. Um, I think I throw my RSI on here. Yeah, it's very um, very similar to G uh, G O L D yeah. symbol that only we just uh, looked because at. of its inexpensiveness. You know, if it goes to six, it's a twenty you know twenty percent jump, and goes to seven, it's fifty percent jump. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, yeah it's uh, it looks like okay. I just put mine on a weekly, so mm -hmm. if you let's see that on a weekly, and I'll point something out that. Um, so we've got two bullish candles coming up before this little pullback is starting. So sometimes you can blend candle sticks together. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a scenario where I think you can do that. So I th think if it uh, pulls back to around four and a half, that might be, uh, give another buy opportunity right. with a risk, you know, right below those previous lows of around 370. Yeah, but that RSI is well above 50, so it does look like it's in a positive mode. Well, the most important thing about that RSI is that it's broken out to a new range. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's uh, jump over uh, before we run out of time to just a small silver one called Pan American Silver, PAAS. Because all of these things were much higher um, before, so if they do get moving, oh, but uh, this one has a little bit of a... Uh, Okeechobee cloud above it or something. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> There's some kind of a cloud in technical Ichi, analysis. Ishimoku. There you Ishimoku go. Ishimoku clouds, there I think, go. is what that is. Let's see. Oh, where'd that chart go? I just had it. That sounds like a Star Wars character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looks like one of my Laza Opsos, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, it's um, it looks like it's trying to form a basing pattern down here, uh, and is it is a potential inverse head and shoulder pattern on here, mm -hmm. and about twenty, just around twenty five ish, is uh, if this is a inverse head and shoulder pattern. And meaning, what I mean by that is if if this is the right shoulder that's forming then that previous low about 2070 ish that right. should not be exceeded on any pullback here right. if this if this holds it can go a little bit lower probably we want to see it too much lower but that left side over there from december the low of 2146 maybe the left shoulder and the head uh being the end of january around 2080 ish and then mm -hmm. this is potentially a right shoulder. And so you can just draw a little trend line across and about 25, 25 ish um, on the upside would be sure. a breakout. And then you can do a little target, you know, measure target from that. Now, the energy in the metals, both in and the industrials look uh, even better than these, but um, the precious and the industrials and the energy seem to be two sectors that uh, may have some legs to it. Uh, before we run out of time, Eric, I want you to briefly, of course, because there's a lot to talk about, but can you briefly explain, you know, how um, you're trying to get uh, or take advantage of uh, the time premium uh, coming out of options and in an environment with a 30 something VIX, obviously there are uh, elevated premiums. And we all know time will go by no matter what anybody says. Right. <laughs> so the only question is, is can we hold our strike prices? And basically, uh, can you explain a little bit about how you take advantage of time going by, how time works for you? And then, of course, how you try to collect the premiums? Yeah, certainly. Well, essentially, part of what we do is we sell option and uh, option premium. We collect the premium and we're looking for what they call theta decay to work its magic, meaning the clock just keeps ticking. And as it does... Uh, there's a you know greater and greater likelihood that you get to keep uh, most of that premium that you've collected unless the market makes a dramatic move uh, to one direction or the other. You know, of course, if, it, if there's a lot of chop in the middle, then that's okay, uh, such as what we've been having. Even though we've had these big dramatic moves, the strikes that we've been selling have been uh, staying out of trouble because they've been so far away from the marketplace to begin with. Um, there is a time where the VIX gets too high and maybe too hot and you want to back away from that type of strategy. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, there's also opportunity. We look at some, uh, some other analysis and research and whatnot and just with our own experience as well. But we also look to uh, you know, sell calls, call spreads on upper, 
upper boundaries on the, the higher ranges when the markets we feel are maybe overdone for a while or we might look to buy put spreads at the same time. We call that a bear head strategy. You can simultaneously sell calls, collect the premium and take that money and then buy puts. And uh, you can also, of course, just uh, do one side of the trade or the other. So we have a, what we call the dragonfly trade or the iron condor trade. You can simply just cut that in half, so to speak, and just do one side of the trade or the other to make that more directional. In fact, um, you know, a condor, if you're doing maybe just saying uh, uh, or, or a dragonfly, for example, where you have uh, three sets of strike prices above the market in, the, in terms of the calls. Uh, so you're, you're selling those and buying those, uh, those strikes as a package and you collect the premium. And even if the market were to rally somewhat, uh, that trade is probably still gonna work well just based on theta decay. And the only time something like that doesn't work is if you get a 10% uh, you know, a, a rally in you know, a two week period of time or something like that then you're gonna become under pressure and have some trouble with that. And you wanna close it out and take your loss and move on. But you know, certainly we do directional strategies as well, you know, mm -hmm. buying vertical spreads, whether they're puts or calls. Uh, right now we're, we've been positioned uh, thankfully correctly with this uh, last couple of months in particular. So that's, that's been working out well for us. And I think since November, the Russell's down, what is it, about 17, 18%. Yeah, NASDAQ, something like 15 something percent. The yeah. S&P was in what they call what correction territory over 10 percent. Right. So, you know, there's some big moves there and I don't think the volatility is over with. So we're going to keep positioning ourselves uh, for uh, whether the market's up or down. We hope to be, um, you know, on the right side of that, of course, and using our our approach, our strategy and using automation to help that kind mm -hmm. of remove the emotion. So a lot of what right. we do is using these algorithms and automation so that once we have positions that are calculated and, and pre-built for us, uh, and now you have that position in your account, and then you don't have to babysit it and screen watch it because the algorithm will basically close out that position for you if that's what you want. And you don't have to uh, you know, lose sleep at night trying to figure out if you need to wake up in the middle of the night and place orders. Or jump off the uh, 18th green and start trying to make a trade or something. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you so are you doing both debit and credit spread sometimes? Yes. Oh, absolutely. okay, good. So that's somebody should know that you're just not only a writer. Yeah, we don't. We can't apply that one strategy to every condition. I guess exactly. is really what it amounts to. I mean, we yeah. know enough to know that not every uh, market condition is going to, you know, mirror the exact same, you know, past condition. So you have to account for applying different strategies at different times, but yeah. uh, that's what we've kind of built out our mechanism to kind of handle really any scenario. Yeah, there's a lot of vernacular here that we've talked about, and there's a lot of moving parts and managing the risk side of it obviously is paramount. And so uh, people uh, should go and check out what you have there. And then basically from there, they can see where, the, where it could or could not fit into their plans. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. It's, a, it's a unique approach to trading. If you're doing options, it's something you should definitely consider. If you're new to options, we have tutorials that can help you along the way, but you're free to call me, email me, eric, E-R-I-K, at altavest.com, and I'll be glad to chat with you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Leslie, you bring a lot to the table, understanding all the technical analysis on these markets, and you obviously teach traders uh, uh, your um, information quite a bit. So could you just explain how people get a hold of you? And also, um, you know, if you have any special offers, this would be a time to extend it. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, come to my website, Trading Live Online, and you'll find a contact form there if you'd like to email me. And please feel free to email me with any questions. But again, I, you know, I teach this um, method of trading, technical analysis, specific patterns. The patterns that I use tend to find highs and lows. They can give you early reversals and in, in low um, risk reward scenarios, uh, but it does take time to study. I, I'm not a big promoter proponent of um, advocating trading as something that's learned very quickly. It's, it's a process. There's many skills that go into it. Um, and it's step by step, but that's how I, that's how I teach traders that I, that I work with. And uh, for me, one of my models also is, you know, method and mindset. We cannot overlook the importance of mindset in trading and developing that as you're learning the technical skills. Um, so that's 
that's what my site's all about. So feel free to email me any questions. I do have, um, it's actually expiring today, but I have a, a course bundle. Uh, if you're interested, I'll send you a link, but it includes my uh, Mastering Pattern Recognition, which is a 12 hour step-by-step, -step, um, all the way from the history of the patterns, uh, intricate learning of the structures and up to developing a trading plan, uh, mindset tips, uh, trade management. And it also is going to include my self-study training course and my trend day trading course and um, the introduction to trading with pattern recognition. If you're just sort of interested in this type of pattern recognition, the introduction to trading with pattern recognition course, which you'll, you'll find under my courses, um, is very reasonably priced. It's three and a half hours and you will definitely know um, if it's something that you would want to proceed further with. But again, feel free to email me any any questions. If you're interested in the in the course package, uh, it also is going to include um, a one on one coaching session uh, with me. So just feel free to email me and I'll send you the information. OK, that's perfect. As far as option professors concerned, we've got a couple of PDF reports that people are very interested in. One is on hedging, where you use calls and puts to protect your portfolio against declines, or you use it for replacement trades, where you go to limited risk options versus having a large position in the account. And the second thing is, is we do have a PDF report on uh, the best, uh, in our view, the best stocks in energy metals, as well as um, uh, cloud computing and also a cybersecurity, among others. So uh, to get that, you go to optionprofessor.com and put in your information. We'll check back with you and let you know how it goes. Uh, thank you, Leslie and uh, Eric, for being here. As usual, Eric, we covered the globe, the wide range of the world, huh? Yeah, sounded sounded great. It's like the uh, ABC wide world, world of sports. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Spanning the globe. Yeah, spanning the globe. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you guys, thanks for being here. And uh, everybody, good luck and good trading and stay safe out there. And I'm going to send it back to David right now. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah, great show today. So just a quick reminder, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. And you can also just go to timingresearch.com. Um, the post at the top of the page right now will become the archive as soon as I can get it posted. And also you can scroll back and find any of the past uh, shows or events uh, there as well. So I just wanna thank my guests again for today. Uh, Leslie Jufas of tradingliveonline.com, Eric Gebhardt of altavest.com and the option professor of optionprofessor.com. Thanks everyone.